Top 10 Lies You Still Believe Hannibal took his war elephants over the Alps. Did he though? Turns out that yes, yes he did. But we tend to take these little nuggets of trivia as fact a bit too often, allowing for many examples of factoids, imbalanced narratives and even out and out revisionist lies to become part of our collective understanding of the past. Number 1. Einstein How many times have you heard of this old chestnut? My old science teacher used to try it out whenever a student failed to understand a concept or got a poor score on a test. This is simply untrue and wildly so as well. Albert Einstein was an exceptional student, a real whiz at the subjects you'd fully expect him to have excelled at. He was reading college level tomes about physics when he was 11. There's no evidence of him attaining anything but high marks on his test. So sorry, Einstein was a genius, but hey, don't worry, Mark Zuckerberg, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs didn't finish college. So for all you dropouts, don't fret, all you need is a cutting edge multi-billion dollar idea and you are good to go. Number 2. Rommel Mead This one can be counted as sort of true in bits. The pervasive nature of this narrative isn't so much an out and out lie as it is a romanticization of that has been referred to as Rommel Mead by some historians. The German Bundeswehr, the current German Unified Armed Forces, seems to have fully accepted the mythos built up around the architect of the initially successful North African campaign, having named buildings after him such as the Field Marshal Rommel Barracks in Augustdorf. Although the Desert Fox was never a member of the Nazi party, he did show quite strong support for German militarism and expansionism, going as far as working between the Nazi institutions as a liaison between Wehrmacht and the Hitler Youth. There is not much doubt that he was not a fan of the SA and later the SS, but this seems to be more of a disdain based on their brutal, wasteful tactics rather than a general disagreement over their shared goals. Number 3. Atom Bombs The attack on Hiroshima resulted in between 90,000 and 146,000 deaths and the attack on Nagasaki resulted in up to 80,000 deaths. Are these the most devastating attacks of the Second World War? By the way, of a single device, yes. Was it a new, terrifying way that many targets died? Yes. Were there significantly more deaths in the atomic attacks on these Japanese cities than traditional bombings? Not at all. The bombing of Tokyo on March 10, 1945 resulted in over 90,000 deaths, possibly over 100,000 deaths and over a million civilians left homeless. This exceeds the total death count of Nagasaki and may be higher than Hiroshima. When you compare the picture of Tokyo, Hiroshima and Nagasaki after their respective attacks, you'd struggle to tell them apart. To quantify the subsequent deaths from privation and particulate inhalation in the case of Tokyo and radiation-borne illness in the cases of Hiroshima and Nagasaki is a rough estimation rendering any measurement of total destructive power difficult. Number 4. Wikipedia did you know that there was a concentration camp in Nazi-aligned Croatia that saw around 100,000 prisoners killed? Maybe you did, but if you are a crowd wanting to learn about the infamous Jasinova camp, also known as the Auschwitz of the Balkans, you may believe it was merely a collection camp used to house enemies of the state and the most of the modern interpretation and historical documentation of the killings are up for debate as evidenced by the Croatian wiki entry giving over 40% of the word space to discussing possible conspiracy theories. This is a clear example of historical revisionism coming from a position of political and ideological bias. But it is fair to say, when you have an open, publicly edited site such as Wikipedia, which purports to be an encyclopedia, this is what we run the risk of getting. Scary stuff. But before we continue with the top 10 lies you still believe, subscribe to our channel Curious Atmosphere that you don't miss any future updates. Number 5. Playing Fields of Eton This is quite a simple one to debunk, but perhaps in an unexpected way. You must think that it's a case of good, working class men rising through the ranks, a decentralized command structure ceding the true decision making to these men thus meaning the mean streets of London and the impoverished, rustic farmlands of English counties the true breeding ground for the victors at Waterloo. Or perhaps a multinational coalition that could all have gone to Eton, with only one in eight being English. It's a bit more obvious than that, from the time Wellington attended Eton to the Battle of Waterloo, Eton had no playing fields. Number 6. Wild West Chaos 
It could be violent, but no more violent or chaotic than pretty much anywhere else in the era. How many AJ's Holmes or Jack the Ripper's preyed in the towns of Tombstone or Dreadwood? The notion of the Old West as a frontier, a hard place to start trying to eke out a living, may well contribute to the pervasive myth that it was a lawless and anarchic place to live. But is there any evidence that it was a violent place? Not really. Many of the most notorious western cattle towns had comparatively low murder rates coupled with some modern statistical gerrymandering in order to compare today's rates to those of the past. Bills on this a priori position in 1880, your chance of being murdered in Dodge City was 1 in 996, whereas in 1980 Miami touted as the murder capital of the world at the time. Your chances of being slain were 1 in 3058. Problem is there was one murder in Dodge City in 1880 amongst a population of 996. There is no discussion as to the nature of the crimes nor the reactions of the populace and scaling this number up is moot. One murder in a calendar year doesn't exactly seem like a crime wave. Number 7. Victorian Prudishness You'd be forgiven for believing that the motto of the British Empire throughout the reign of the Queen Victoria may have been, well, and never accompanied by an obligatory release of one's monocle into a china cup, or in the case of finding yourself being a lady, feigning with the back of the one's hand gently pressed to one's forehead. The legendary prim and proper behavior associated with this era is, of course, nonsense. But after a third of working class brides already up the duff, when walking down the aisle, you'd imagine that a slightly more liberal outlook was common regarding sexuality. The era also gave us Leopold von Satter massage, whose writings gave rise to the coining of the term messagism, a phenomenon widely observed enough of the era to merit naming. Given that monocle prices remained steady in the era, we can also deduce that the causes of the ruination of ivor via bone, china collisions remained low. Number 8. Egyptian Slavery Who better to complete a vast building project than a bunch of malnourished captured foreigners that you pay to a pulp if they aren't meeting quotas? Certainly not a fully paid, well-respected workforce of craftspeople who you honor in life and remember after they die. Yes, that does sound more efficient. The persistent demonization of past civilians has been a persistent in academia and pop culture as a glorification of fallen empires. Things are seldom that simple or that binary. Number 9. Nation vs. Nation Click read no person in this era. The idea of fighting for one's country is a very modern one, along with the national identities held by many. The romantic notion of a nation assembled behind their king or queen, amassing a great force to repel an invading army is exactly that, a romantic notion. When Britain was a collection of petty kingdoms, many of the largest conflicts occurred between rival factions from within what would now be known as England. Wessex and Mercia going head to head, a rival Welsh kingdom like those of Gwynedd and Dyfed spring to mind. But even in such cases like this, it was often two groups of paid soldiers fighting for a paymaster, no particular ideology. Even more confusing is the fact that many of these petty kingdoms provided soldiers to fight alongside what would be considered their natural enemies. Case in point, Wine Glindor, Welsh rebel hero and cultural icon, rebelled against English rule, conquered vast swathes of his native land, and started advancing into England itself before mysteriously disappearing. Why did he do this? Some of his lands were confiscated by the crown and given to a non-Welsh lord. It was a case that pertained as much to a property gripe as it did to an overarching will for freedom. In a time before nation-states, national honor simply wasn't a thing. Number 10. Victoria Cross Medal It is an incredible honor for any British serviceman to be awarded the VC equivalent to the US Medal of Honor, only given to the most daring, self-sacrificing soldiers. From men who conducted incredible solo raids, capturing and eliminating many enemies to amazing acts of selfless rescue, many times involving taking heavy enemy fire to save a fallen comrade. These stories are true, but the origin of how each metal is manufactured seems to be a fanciful myth, quite often trotted out in an official setting. The story seems to have been originally propagated after reported in an 1847 newspaper covering metal ceremony in Hyde Park. The honor bestowed upon the recipients doesn't need to be mythologized when the action of the individuals who win the right to wear this highest of honors will serve just fine. 
based on what we think is worthy. If you have more to share with us, share them in the comments below and wait for our interesting topics coming soon. If you think they deserve to be on the list, share your opinion in the comments below.